Hi there, our highly valued, treasured and esteemed viewers and listeners and welcome back to your channel of choice. This video I am about to present was compiled by Dr. Natharua, a clinical pharmacist by training and profession who is the founder of Progressive Pharmacotherapy Consultants. The premier virtual clinical pharmacy institute for capacity building for healthcare workers. The Virtual Clinical Pharmacy Institute with a Difference, where patient safety, medication therapy management and optimal clinical outcomes are very crucial and non-negotiable to us. Here we seek to remain your premier source of crucial tips for high-impact pharmacotherapy services. So, on behalf of the Institute, I humbly urge you all to sit back and spare me part of your very precious time to share with you very useful tips which may prove very, very handy in your line of duty. I now welcome you all to part 217 of our Pharmacotherapy MCQ series which majors in infectious diseases. And the first question reads, about 8 hours after eating a seafood dinner, a patient develops diarrhea, bradycardia, temperature-related dysesthesia and circumoral paresthesiae. So my question to you is, which of the following are her symptoms most suggestive of? Is it A. Botulism, or B. Seaguatera poisoning, or C. Enterotoxigenic Escherichia coli infection, or D. Paralytic shellfish poisoning? Or is it E. Scombroid poisoning? I will give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer to this question from the listed options. And the correct answer is, B. Seaguatera poisoning. I will explain why, she most likely has ciguatoxin poisoning. Early symptoms can include abdominal cramps, diarrhea and circumoral paresthesiae. Later neurologic symptoms can include a sensation of reversal of hot and cold perception. Please proceed to the next question. And the next question reads, 27 people on an Alaskan cruise became ill over a three-day period. They all reported gastrointestinal symptoms, with nausea and vomiting initially, and then they all developed watery, non-bloody diarrhea. All recovered within two to three days of symptom onset with supportive care only. So my question to you is, what is the most likely causative pathogen? Is it A. Clostridioides difficile, or B. Enterohemorrhagic Escherichia coli, or C. Norovirus, or D. Salmonella typhi, or is it E. Shigella dysenteriae? I will give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer to this question from the listed options. And the correct answer is, C. Norovirus. I will clarify why. Norovirus is the most common cause of non-bacterial acute enteritis and has been associated with outbreaks in hospitals and long-term care institutions, as well as cruise ships, because it is highly contagious. Nausea and vomiting predominate initially and then patients develop watery, non-bloody diarrhea. The illness is typically self-limited and resolves within a few days. Please progress to the next question. And the next question reads, in which of the following etiologies is antibiotic therapy not recommended in treatment of diarrhea? Is it A. Clostridioides difficile, or B. Enterohemorrhagic Escherichia coli, or C. Giardia lamblia, or D. Shigella sonae? Or is it E. Vibrio cholerae? I will give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer to this question from the listed options. And the correct answer is B. Enterohemorrhagic Escherichia coli. 
I will justify why. Antimicrobial therapy for sugar toxin producing enterohemorrhagic Escherichia coli enteritis is controversial. Some studies have reported increased risk of progression to hemolytic uremic syndrome in patients who were treated with antibiotics. Antibiotics are recommended for patients with jardiasis, cholera and clostridioides difficile associated colitis. Antibiotic therapy may not be necessary for patients with shigellosis, but can be beneficial in reducing symptom duration, treating severe illness and decreasing risk of transmission. Please proceed to the next question. And the next question reads, HKL, a 32-year-old woman from Jamaica has a history of chronic watery diarrhea. Recently, she had to receive high-dose steroids for a new diagnosis of systemic lupus erythematosus. HKL presents now with several days of fever and headache and her blood cultures and CSF cultures are growing Escherichia coli. In addition to antibacterial therapy, what additional medications could be considered to treat her underlying condition? Could it be a. ivermectin, or b. niclosamide, or c. nifertamix, or d. paramomycin, or could it be e. prazicantel? I will give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer to this question from the listed options. And the correct answer is, A. Ivermectin. I will clarify why. This patient likely has infection with Strongyloides stercoralis, which is more common in tropical countries. It typically causes infection limited to the lung and GI tract, but, in immunocompromised hosts, it can also cause hyperinfection syndrome that can present as gram-negative bacteremia and meningitis because of parasite-driven translocation of enteric bacteria. Treatment of choice for strongyloidiasis is ivermectin. Please proceed to the next question. And the next question reads, which of the antimicrobials listed below is not currently recommended as an empiric antibiotic for traveler's diarrhea? Is it A. Azithromycin, or B. Ciprofloxacin, or C. Levofloxacin, or D. Rifaximin, or is it E. Trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole? I will give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer to this question from the listed options. And the correct answer is, E, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. I will explain why. Most cases of traveler's diarrhea are self-limited, but if patients have more than four stools in 24 hours, and or associated fever, blood, mucus or pus in the stool, antibiotic therapy is indicated. Recommended antibiotics include a fluoroquinolone, rifaximin, or azithromycin. Please proceed to the next question. And the next question reads, in which of the following infections can non-chirotic portal hypertension be a feature? Is it A. Ascaris lumbricoides, or B. Echinococcus granulosis, or C. Entamoeba histolytica, or D. Schistosoma japonicum, or is it in E. strongyloides stercoralis? I will give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer to this question from the listed options. And the correct answer is, D. Schistosoma japonicum. I will explain why. Schistosomiasis, particularly, caused by infection with Schistosoma japonicum and Schistosoma mansoni can cause granulomatous liver involvement that leads to portal fibrosis with development of portal hypertension and splenomegaly. Please proceed to the next question. And the next question reads, CST, a patient with HIV and HBV co-infection and cirrhosis is referred to the infectious diseases clinic. CST has not been on antiretroviral therapy and has no predicted resistance to HIV medications based on his HIV genotype. 
CST and his hepatologist want to start him on therapy for HBV, as well. CST does not want to take more than one pill per day. Of the following options, which is the most appropriate regimen? Is it A. Efavirens plus Abacavir plus Lamivudine? Or B. Entecavir plus Ritonavir plus Darunavir plus Raltegravir? Or C. Lamivudine plus Abacavir plus Dolotegravir? Or D. Abacavir plus Lamivudine plus Zidavudine? Or is it E. Tenofovir plus Emtricetabine plus Lvtegravir plus Cobicistat? I will give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer to this question from the listed options. And the correct answer is E. Tenofovir plus Emtricetabine plus Lvtegravir plus Cobicistat. I will justify why. Management of HIV and HBV co-infected patients is challenging. Treating his HIV infection is paramount. Options A to D all include drugs with activity against HBV, but also have activity against HIV and independently would constitute incomplete regimens for management of his HIV that would likely precipitate development of drug resistance. Monotherapy for treatment of HBV is also not recommended because of the potential to precipitate development of drug resistance. Inclusion of two drugs with activity against HBV, such as tenofovir and emtricetabine or lamivudine, and a third drug, also with activity against his HIV, would be recommended. Co-formulated emtricetabine plus tenofovir plus lvtegravir plus cobicistat would allow him to take a single daily tablet that would provide him with multidrug therapy for his HIV and HBV. Please progress to the next question. And the next question reads, FTY, a patient is tested for HBV and the results are as follows, HBSAG negative, HBCAB positive, HBSAB negative. So my question to you is, which of the following is not a possible explanation for these results? Is it A. False negative HBSAG, or B. False positive HBCAB, or C. HBV immune, secondary to vaccination? Or D. Remote HBV infection? Or is it E. Resolving acute HBV? I will give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer to this question from the listed options. And the correct answer is, C. HBV immune, secondary to vaccination. I will justify why. The serologic pattern associated with vaccine-induced immunity to HBV would be HBV SAG, negative, HBCAB negative, HBSAB positive. Patients with resolving acute HBV may not yet have had time to develop HBSAB and patients with distant HBV infection may have waning levels of HBSAB. Isolated positive HBCAB could also be a false positive result. False negative HBSAG results have also been reported. Please advance to the next question. And the next question reads, PPU, a 19-year-old girl presented to the emergency room with three days of fever and migratory polyarthralgias. PPU initially had swelling in her left ankle and noticed a small pustule near her Achilles tendon. PPU's ankle improved the next day, but she started to have pain and swelling in her right knee and left wrist. Synovial fluid from PPU's right knee showed 60,000 per microliter nucleated cells with 80% polymorphonuclear leukocytes. Gram stain of the fluid was negative. Synovial fluid and blood cultures are pending. PPU is started on broad empiric antibiotics. So my question to you is, what infection is the most likely in PPU's clinical scenario? 
Is it a. Neisseria gonorrhoeae, or b. Neisseria meningitidis, or c. Parvovirus b19, or d. Staphylococcus aureus, or is it e. Streptococcus pneumoniae? I will give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer to this question from the listed options. And the correct answer is A. Neisseria gonorrhoeae. I will clarify why. Disseminated gonococcal infection can manifest as a syndrome of fever, polyarthralgia, and rash with bacteremia, tenosynovitis, and septic arthritis. Blood cultures are often positive, but synovial fluid cultures may be negative. Evaluation of samples from the cervix, urethra, rectum, pharynx or urine with PCR testing for Neisseria gonorrhoeae may assist in the diagnosis of disseminated gonococcal infection. Please progress to the next question. And the next question reads, TLC, a patient in Connecticut presents with several days of low-grade fevers, malaise and a large, well-demarcated erythematous patch on his thigh. The area of erythema is not tender to palpation and he has no other skin lesions. Pause the video and closely scrutinize the photo before progressing to the question below. So my question to you is, from what type of tick bite is this patient most likely to have acquired the infection? Is it a. Amblyoma maculatum, or b. Dermacenta variabilis, or c. Ixodes pacificus, or d. Ixodes scapularis, or is it from e. Rhyphocephalus sanguineus? I will give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer to this question from the listed options. And the correct answer is D. Ixodes scapularis. I will clarify why. The photograph shows erythema migrans, which, in a patient from New England, is most suggestive of Lyme disease, which is transmitted by Ixodes scapularis. Southern tick associated rash illness, abbreviated as STERI, can present with similar skin findings, and is transmitted by Amblyoma americanum. Please progress to the next question. And the next question reads, VRL, a 35-year-old pregnant woman presents with erythema migrans. So my question to you is, which is the least appropriate antibiotic agent to administer in VRL's treatment? Is it A. Amoxicillin, or B. Ceftriaxone, or C. Cefuroxime, or D. Doxycycline or is it E. Penicillin G? I will give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer to this question from the listed options. And the correct answer is D. Doxycycline. I will explain why. Doxycycline is relatively contraindicated for administration in pregnant and breastfeeding women and for children below 8 years of age because of concern for possibility of deleterious effects on skeletal development. Please proceed to the next question. And the next question reads, DDF, a 45-year-old woman presented to the emergency room with acute onset of unilateral facial paralysis. DDF hikes in the woods frequently, has had several tick bites, and noted an area of redness around an area from which she removed a tick a few weeks ago. So my question to you is, what is the most likely cause of DDF's symptoms? Is it A. Borrelia burgdorferi? Or B. HIV? Or C. HSV? Or D. Sarcoidosis? Or is it E. V. Z. V? I will give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer to this question from the listed options. And the correct answer is A. 
Borrelia burgdorferi. I will explain why. Facial nerve palsy has been reported in association with a variety of infectious and non-infectious conditions. HSV reactivation is thought to be the cause in most cases, but this patient has had recent tick bites and Lyme disease is the most likely diagnosis. Please progress to the next question. And the next question reads, which of the scenarios listed below is not an indication for antibiotic prophylaxis against infective endocarditis for patients undergoing dental procedures that include gingival manipulation? Is it a. History of prosthetic joint placement. Or b. Non-repaired cyanotic congenital heart disease. Or c. Prior episode of infective endocarditis or D. Prosthetic cardiac valve. Or is it E. Rheumatic heart disease? I will give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer to this question from the listed options. And the correct answer is E. Rheumatic heart disease. I will clarify why. Antibiotic prophylaxis for endocarditis is recommended for patients with prosthetic cardiac valves, previous history of endocarditis, cardiac transplants with valvulopathy and some patients with congenital heart disease, including those with non-repaired cyanotic CHD, those less than six months out from CHD repair with prosthetic materials, and those with repaired CHD with prosthetic materials greater than six months prior and with residual local defects at the site of the repair that could impede endothelization. So there you have it, our highly esteemed viewers and listeners, that brings us to the end of this video. If it benefited you in any way, kindly remember to give it a thumbs up, to like it and to share it widely with your peers. Please leave your comments at the bottom. And if you haven't yet done so, I humbly urge you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I would like to promise you all that the very, very best is yet to come. Thank you very much for viewing this video. On behalf of our senior colleague, Dr. Nath Arua, I sincerely appreciate your partnership, continued support and kind collaboration. We look forward to interacting with you in the next video, which will be part 218.